Facebook. Let's just check it out. Soon we are live. Let's see. Second, just gotta check this out. Make sure that we're live on Facebook. We are live. Yes, we are alive. <laughs> okay. That's me. And let's see one more thing we gotta do. We have to put everybody on mute. Yes, the beginning of Prosciutto Mass. Yes, and Gurmash has taken away your past Parabda and Aparabda Karma. Actually, the holy names did it. So, yes, Purushottam Mas, very nice. Okay, so this is the first day of Purushottam Mas. And let's, yeah, I got everything ready to go. There's one thing I want to announce at the beginning of the class, and I'll make sure that it happens, is that I have to end this class by 6 o'clock sharp because we have uh, a Vyasa Puja for Bhakti Chumars that I have to attend. So it's going to be a little shorter tonight. I'll end the Bhagavad Gita reading a little before so it gives time for all of you to ask some questions. But by 6 o'clock our time or 8 o'clock Australia time or 10 o'clock New Zealand Fiji time in the morning, then, okay. Okay, let's chant Jai Radha Madhava. Jai Radha Madhuva Kunjabihari Jai Radha Madhuva Kunjabihari Gopi Janabalabha Giri Bharadhari Gopi Jana Malabha Giri Bharadhari Yashodanandana Raja Jana Ranjana Yashodanandana Raja Jana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Banachari Yamuna Tira Banachari Jaya Rad Omadhuva Kunya Bihari Jaya Rad Omadhuva Kunya Bihari Gopi Jana Malabat Giri Bharad Hagunti Gopi Jana Malaba Giri Manadhori Yashoda Nandana Raja Jana Ranjana Yashoda Nandana Raja Jana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Manachari Yamuna Tira Banachari Jaya Radhan Umadhova Kunya Bihari Jaya Radhan Umadhova 
Kunjabi Havi Jayom Vishnupad Padamahangasa Paravitakacharya Ulta Teda Sitashi Shimad His Divine Grace of Aya Chadana Dabakibadana Gosami Shila Prabhupad Kijai Iskan Founder Acharya Shila Prabhupad Kijai Ananda Goti Vaishnav Vindigajai Namacharya Shilohidas Thakur Gijai, Prem Say Goho Shri Krishna, Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shidway to Gadadha, Shiva Siddhi Gaur Vakta Vrind Nikijai, Shishi Radhakrishna, Gopi Gopinath Shai Mukun Radhakunda, Kiri Gopardan Kijai, Vrindavan Kijai, Maturadan Kijai, Jagadatha Sami Kijai, Nimai Kijai, Shimadi Glassi Kijai. Samaveda Bhakta Vrindigajai Gaur Premananda Hari Hari Om. All glorious the assembled devotees. All glorious the assembled devotees. All glorious the assembled devotees. All glorious to Shi, Guru, and Gauranga. Shri Prabhupada Kijai Gaur Premananda Hari 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 Om. Shri Maung Vishnu Bharai Krishna Prasad Bhutale. Shimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Namani Namaste Saraswati Devi Gorvati Pacharani Nivasesha Sunyavati Paschacha Deja Tarani. So, Omagana Timadanda Shagadan Jana Shlakya Chakshuru Miditam Yena Tesbai Shikadvay Namaha. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of my spiritual master. His divine grace, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Shilpapadu, so kindly opened my eyes with a torchlight of knowledge while I was blinded in the darkness of ignorance. So, let us start with the 17th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Actually, we're, I wouldn't say we're almost finished, because the 17th and 18th chapter of the Gita uh, are very long chapters. Okay, especially 18th chapter, extremely long chapter, with a lot of information for all of us about different factors, and there's a lot of information about the modes of nature in these two last chapters, interestingly enough, and other subject matters. But I would say the modes of nature really take it. Okay, so let's start chapter 17. And, let's see, here we go. Chapter 17, the divisions of faith. So faith is important. Uh, remember how we describe faith? Just to reiterate a little bit. Uh, faith according to Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami, and he used a Bengali verse, Shraddha Shabdevisha Sakahe Sidrinanisya. Faith means to believe in something so much that just by doing what that person or uh, scripture, or whatever, wants us to do, we do it. So that's the test of faith. Faith is more than just belief. Okay. So let's talk, talk about the types of faith. There are three types of faith corresponding to and evolving from the three modes of material nature, goodness, passion, ignorance. Acts performed by those whose faith is in passion and ignorance yield only in permanent material results, whereas acts performed in goodness according to scriptural injunctions purify the heart and lead to pure faith in Lord Krishna and devotion to him. Now here, we're talking about of course, faith in the purified modes of goodness. Let me be a little more specific. Yes, there's three material modes of nature. Ignorance, passion, goodness. But even the mode of goodness in this material world has some contamination from the other two modes. It's not pure. Because it's based upon one's own satisfaction. As I mentioned before, in the mode of goodness, you're satisfied with being peaceful, seeing the beauty of nature, uh, seeing the ocean or mountains. There's nothing wrong with that. But you're just satisfied. That's it. That's it. Mode of goodness. But in the transcendental mode of goodness, which is called purified goodness, or shuddha sattva, or vishuddha sattva, uh, then there's no other desire other than to please Krishna and Wherever you look, you see Krishna. Okay. So really, we're talking about four modes. Only three modes of material nature. But four modes in essence. 
Okay. Start with text one, which is a question raised by Arjuna. Arjuna Uvacha, ye Shastra Vidim Mutrija, Isunte Shariyam Vitaha, Tesham Nishta to Ka Krishna, Satvam Aho Rajas Tamaha. Arjuna Uvacha, Arjuna said, Ye, those who Shastra Vidim, uh, the regulations of scripture. Remember the word Shastra means scripture or rules. Vidim means the regulations. Utsrija, giving up. Yajante, worship. Shadaya, with faith. And also that word Shadaya comes from Shada, which basically means to give one's heart to something or someone. So it's more than just belief, like we described before. It means having total conviction and giving one, one's very self to the object of love and devotion. Shadaya, with full faith. Anvita, possessed of Tesham, of them. Nishta, the faith. It's interesting. <coughs> you know, Nishta is translated as the faith, but it basically means steadiness. So you can take it as meaning the steady faith, 24-7. Nishta is also one of the stages in devotional service in which one is fixed or stable. And Krishna consciously let me turn off this air conditioner so you can hear me better. Tu, but, ka, what? Krishna, O oh Krishna, sattvam in goodness, a whole or else, rajaha in passion, tamaha in ignorance. So Arjuna is making an inquiry that any of us might make. O oh Krishna, what is the situation of those who do not follow the principles of scripture or worship according to their own imagination? Are they in goodness, in passion, or in ignorance? Now Arjuna has just asked the question that relates to basically every religious expression in the world. Not to the, it doesn't relate to the origin of every religion in the world. There's bona fide Christianity, bona fide Islamic tradition, bona fide Judaism, bona fide Vaishnavism, of course. But what we find nowadays is that whatever Shastra, okay, scripture, the people have, they derive meanings to suit their own particular purposes. In other words, they have some agenda. <laughs> like a famous commentary, commentator on the Bhagavad Gita, Dr. Radhakrishna, when he commented on the Bhagavad Gita, he had his own agenda, even though Krishna said what? Always think of me, become my devotee, worship me, and surrender unto me, and love me, and this me, and that me, and that me. He said, well, Krishna doesn't mean me, himself. Krishna means something else. So most of the times, people are deriving philosophy that has nothing to do with the original founder, or in the original founder's name, or in the Shastra's name, they put forth their own opinion. This is intellectual dishonesty, and that's really what's going on in 99.99% of the world today. For example, if I approach someone generally of the Christian faith and I say, you should not kill animals, they'll say, animals have no soul. And I ask them, why do you think animals have no soul? They say, well, that's well, we're taught in Christianity, but it ain't nowhere in the Bible where it says animals have no soul. And then they bring out another verse from the Bible that states that man shall have, or mankind, should have dominion over all of God's creatures. And they say, that gives us right to eat all of God's creatures. Well, there's a difference between dominion and prasadam. <laughs> dominion and food, okay. Because, uh, for example, a parent may have dominion over uh, the children. Obviously, they probably should until the children grow up. And so, do the parents have the right to eat the children? Probably not in our culture. Okay. So, this, the problem with, with what people do with Shastra or what people do without using Shastra, 
you know, both cases are bogus, useless, hopeless. And Arjuna is asking a question about this. You know, if someone concocts things and does things in religion that is not in Shastra, you know, like they have religion in the mode of ignorance or worship of the ghosts and spirits. Ooh. And worship <laughs> the mode of passion, worship politicians. For example, before the last election in the United States, 2016 the presidential election, there was someone in India who made a temple to Donald Trump and he was worshiping him. Mode of passion. Anyway, so in the fourth chapter, 39th verse, it is said that a person faithful to a particular type of worship gradually becomes elevated to the stage of knowledge and attains the highest professional stage of peace and prosperity. In the 16th chapter, it is concluded that one who does not follow the principles laid down in the scriptures is called an asura, demon. And one who follows the scriptural injunctions faithfully is called a deva, or demigod. Now, if one with faith follows some rules which are not mentioned in the scriptural injunctions, what's his position? You know, just pick and choose. Uh, that's what most people do. They want to pick and choose which rule to follow. Hmm. It's like, well, the Jewish religion, they follow the rule of eating matzah on Passover. Of course, I'm not going to explain what that is. It's just like a cracker. They'll follow some. A ritualistic rule, but they won't follow the Ten Commandments. Which is kind of funny. This doubt of Arjuna's is to be cleared by Krishna. Are those who create some sort of God by selecting a human being and placing their faith in him, worshipping in goodness, passion, or ignorance? Do such persons attain the perfectional stage of life? Is it possible for them to be situated in real knowledge and elevate themselves to the highest perfectional stage? To those who do not follow the rules and regulations of scriptures, but who have faith in something and worship gods and demigods and men, attain success in their efforts. Arjuna is putting these questions to Krishna. These are important questions. Because everyone lives by faith. What do you mean? You know, we have to have some faith that, you know, like if you eat your meal, you're not going to be poisoned. Uh, Faith that, you know, if I take a step, I'm not going to fall off a cliff. Faith, basically, that I'm alive. Or faith that, anyway, faith that breathing is going to help me. So there's so much, we live by faith. Okay. So Krishna is going to make that point a little later. Sri Bhagavan Vacha, Sri Vada Bhavati Shraddha Dehinam Swabhavaja, Satviki Rajasai Chaiva Tamasi Keti Tam Shrinu. Sri Bhagavan Vacha, the Supreme Personality of God, had said, Sri Vira, of three kinds, Bhavati becomes Shraddha, the faith. Dehinam, of the embodied. Like, remember, De, Deha means body, Dehi is the person who has a body, and Dehinam means of the embodied. Sa, that, Swabhava Cha, according to his mode of material nature, Sattviki in the mode of goodness, Rajasi in the mode of passion, Cha also, Eva certainly, C in the mode of ignorance, cha and et thus tam that shrinu here for me. Translation: The supreme personality of God had said, according to the modes of nature acquired by the embodied soul, one's faith can be of three kinds: in goodness, and passion, or in ignorance. Now hear about this. So that's pretty easy to understand. Like if I'm not following shastra and I develop my own faith, religion, trust, whatever you may call it, that faith, religion, trust, is going to be in the mode that I'm in. As simple as that. Because that's what's influencing my consciousness, if I'm in the modes of nature. And whatever I develop, whether I do artwork or music or faith, it's all influenced by the modes of nature, as Krishna says in the Gita, everyone's forced to act helplessly. And think helplessly. Believe helplessly. According to the impulses born, the modes of nature. Those who know the rules and regulations of the scriptures, but out of laziness or indolence, give up the following these rules and regulations are governed by the modes of material nature. In other words, you're in a worse situation if you know the rules and you don't follow them. According to their previous... Yeah, otherwise you're innocent. 
according to their previous act, but innocent still, you do get a reaction. That's a fact, right? You may not know that firebirds, you may be a little kid, and not know that the law of nature is that fire is going to burn your finger. But it doesn't matter, it'll burn your finger. According to their previous activities and the modes of goodness, passion, or ignorance, they acquire a nature which is of a specific quality. The association of the living entity with different modes of nature has been going on perpetually since the living entity is in contact with material nature. He acquires different types of mentality according to his association with the material modes. That's the verse I've quoted many times before, Karanam Guna Sangasya Sevasad Janma Jonishu. But this nature can be changed if one associates with a bona fide spiritual master and abides by his rules and the scriptures. So, in other words, the spiritual masters of the pure devotees mm, mode, a transcendental mode, hopefully, the Shuddha Shalva, actually rubs off on you. Just being in the same location with someone who is pure, then your consciousness changes immediately. I remember the first time I met Prabhupada, 1971, Prabhupada walked into the room. Well, actually, I was, where was I when I first? I mean, I know I was in Gainesville. Was I in a room? No, I was outside throwing flowers at Prabhupada. Actually, we had uh, gone swimming with alligators to get lotus flowers from Prabhupada. And so when, when Prabhupada came to the temple, we were all showering flowers on Prabhupada. And as soon as I saw him, I just fell free of the modes of nature. <laughs> It was amazing. It was like a miracle just by the physical association with his divine grace, Prabhupada. Gradually, one can change his position from ignorance to goodness or from passion to goodness. The conclusion is that blind faith in a particular mode of nature cannot help a person become elevated to the perfectional stage. One has to consider things carefully with intelligence in the association of a bona fide spiritual master. Thus, one can change his position to a higher mode of nature. And that association is not just physical. We remember the Vani Vapu stuff. Uh, Vapu is the body, Vani is the instructions, sound vibration. So when you hear sound vibration of a great devotee, then it just goes right to the heart and clears out the modes of nature. And here's an interesting verse about how everybody functions on the basis of faith. Satvanu rupa sarva shasrada bhavati bharata. Tadamayo yam purusho yo yatsrada saiva saha. Satva anurupa. According to the existence sarva of everyone, shrada, faith, bhavati becomes bharata, son of bharata. Shrada, faith, maya, having, you know, full of. Ayam, this, purushaha, the living entity. Ya, who, yat, having which. Shradaha, faith, saha, thus. Eva, certainly, saha, he. O son of Bharata, according to one's existence under the various modes of nature, one involves a particular kind of faith, pretty much the same thing. The living being is said to be of a particular faith according to the modes he has acquired. In other words, everyone has faith in something. You couldn't live if you didn't have faith in something. Faith that people have faith that sense gratification is the goal of life. Everyone has a particular type of faith, regardless of what he is. But his faith is considered good, passionate, or ignorant, three modes of nature, according to the nature he has acquired. Thus, according to his particular type of faith, one associates with certain persons. So if I have faith in the mode of goodness, this material mode of goodness, remember we talked about four modes, then I will associate with people, I will go climbing mountains, go to the beach, and maybe go surfing too, but that's that's probably passion and ignorance. Anyway, so, and I will associate with people like that, and we'll sing around the campfire eating vegetarian food. <laughs> and if I associate with people in the mode of passion, then we're going to go to watch romantic films. Yuck. Anyway, different things like that. Now, the re and ignorance, then I will go to the pub. If I associate with people in the mode of ignorance, Pub means, anyway, that is a bar for those of you in America. Now, the real fact is that every living being, as is stated in the 15th chapter, is originally a fragmental part and parcel of the Supreme Lord. Remember that? Amivamsa Jiva Loka Jiva Buddha Sanatana. 
Hmm. Therefore, uh, one is originally transcendental to all the modes of material nature, originally transcendental, but we blew it. But when one forgets his relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead and comes into contact with the material nature and conditional life, he generates his own position by association with the different varieties of material nature. There's that association again. The resultant artificial faith and existence are only material. Like I said, everything's covered by the wet paint of the modes of nature. That's a metaphor, of course. And so you're getting wet paint on you and having a certain color. Let's say you become gold or something like that. Yeah, let's say you paint it all over your body. Uh, that's artificial. Because when you wash it off, you come back to your original color. Although one may be conducted by some impression or some conception of life, originally he is near guna, means without the modes or without the ropes, or without goodness, passion, and ignorance, or transcendental. Therefore, one has to become cleansed of the material contamination that he has acquired in order to regain his relationship with the Supreme Lord. So that material contamination that we have acquired has been acquired through many births in this material world. It's like we've gone out in the material world and we haven't taken a bath for billions of years. We would smell pretty bad. So we haven't taken a bath. Actually, sometimes it's described that the chanting, Sarvatma Swapanam, Param Vijayate Shri Krishna said. Uh, it's a bath, according to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Sarvabha Snapanam. Sarvabha Snapanam. That means it's a complete bath of the soul when we chant the holy names of the Lord. It gets rid of all these different impressions that we've accumulated for many, many different lifetimes. There's this word called samskara. So samskara sometimes means some religious performance, but actually it means impressions. So we have all these impressions on our subtle body. And we're born in a certain way, and these impressions are there from our past lives. It's like some people have phobias. A phobia would be, let's say, they're afraid of heights or afraid of spiders. I remember when I was young, for no reason whatsoever, I was deathly afraid of spiders. I would be afraid of looking under a chair in a dark spot. This is a spider would come. But now I'm not anymore. I like spiders. That is the only path. You know, different impressions. Or basically what we didn't like to eat when we were young or forced to eat when we were young. We have this PTSD post-traumatic stress disorder. But, so this PTSD can actually uh, be sourced mm, in past lives, not necessarily in this life. It's like when you sit down on the psychiatrist's couch and he or she asks you, when did this all begin? And then you say, well, as many years before I was born. I was born in uh, Alaska, and I was an Eskimo, and that's why I don't like ice anymore, because my whole house was ice. I would never take a bath the whole winter, and everything was freezing. You know, anyway, that's one example. That is the only path back without fear, Krishna consciousness. If one is situated in Krishna consciousness, then his path is guaranteed or his elevation to the perfectional stage. If one does not take to this path of self-realization, then he's surely to be conducted by the influence of the modes of nature. So you got a choice. Modes or Krishna. Up to you. Happiness or misery. Or in the material world, you know, there's mixed happiness, misery, mode of passion, mixed happiness, misery. You know, in the beginning, it appears to be like nectar. Remember we read that? In the end, it's like poison, happiness in the mode of passion. Just like a boy sees a girl, girl sees a boy. And like, oh, it's irresistible force. Forever and ever and ever. And then they get together. Maybe they get married, hopefully. And then they have all these arguments. 
And the lady says, you never understood me. And the man says, what do you mean by that? You're always saying that, and back and forth. And what happened to that mode of passion, original feeling that you used to have? It went away. So, and that's why people have multiple, and some people have multiple marriages. And that's not the only reason. It's because that, that new feeling, you know, the beginning feeling is really attractive in the mode of passion. But the end feeling, yuck. So the word, sorry about that, sitting out class. The word shraddha, or faith, is very significant in this verse. Shraddha, or faith, originally comes out of the mode of goodness. One's faith may be in a demigod or some created god or some mental concoction. One's strong faith is supposed to be productive of the works of material goodness. But in material condition life, no works are completely purified. In other words, there's a tinge of goodness that gives you faith, even though your faith may be in the mode of passion. But the, the idea of faith, or you know, firm conviction, comes from goodness. That's why the modes are mixed. That's what Prabhupada says here. They are mixed. They're non-pure goodness. Pure goodness is transcendental and purified goodness. One can understand the real nature of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. As long as one's faith is not completely in purified goodness, the faith is subject to contamination by any of the modes of material nature. The contaminated modes of material nature expand to the heart. This is very poetic. Therefore, according to the position of the heart, in contact with a particular, you know, heart things like the soul, the feelings, in contact with a particular mode of material nature, one's faith is established. You know, that's why people have faith in ghosts. That's why people do voodoo when they have faith in Shantaria or something like that. I mean, I have so many stories in South America when I used to live there of people who are worshipping ghosts and spirits and doing voodoo. It was such an interesting place to live. It should be understood that if one's heart is in the mode of good, there were real witches there. Real witches. And they could ride on broomsticks. It's called ketchari. Not kitchari. It should be understood that if one's heart is in the mode of goodness, his faith is also in the mode of goodness. If his heart is in the mode of passion, his faith, faith is also in the mode of passion. And if his heart is in the mode of darkness, illusion. Ignorance. His faith is also thus contaminated. Thus we find different types of faith in this world. And there are different types of religions due to different types of faith. Hmm. Interesting. The real uh, principles of religious faith, principle of religious faith, is situated in the mode of pure goodness, but because the heart is tainted, we find different types of religious principles. Thus, according to different types of faith, there are different kinds of worship. Uh, and the Bhagavatam presents pure transcendental information by which one can have pure transcendental faith. Dharma prajita kaita vocha paramo niramatsaranam satam. This Bhagavatam kicks out, there's one verse in the Bhagavatam, cheating religion, kaitava dharma, and just presents the actual pure thing. Now here we're going to get into actually objects of worship, which is really interesting. Yashante sattvika devan yaksha raksamsi rajasaha vetan bhuta gatam chandye yashante tamasa janaha Yashante worship sattvikaha those are in the mode of goodness devan demigods yaksha raksamsi demon Rajasaha, those who are on the mode of passion, Pratan, spirits of the dead, Bhuta Ganan, ghosts, Cha, and Anye, others. Yajante worship, Tamasaha, in the mode of ignorance, Janaha, people. Translation, in the mode of goodness, men in the mode of goodness worship the demigods. Those are the, because demigods are devotees, and they're not usually pure devotees, but at least they're devotees. Those in the mode of passion worship the demons, and those in the mode of ignorance Worship the ghosts and spirits. Take out your Ouija board. Ooh. Take out your tarot cards. What do the ghosts say today? <laughs> we have this Ouija board, this automatic writing. 
chant Hare Krishna, and that would be good. So, in this verse, the Supreme Personality of God, it describes different kinds of worshippers according to their external activities. According to scriptural injunction, only the Supreme Personality of God is worshipable. But those who are not very conversant with or faithful to the scriptural injunctions worship different objects according to their specific situations and modes of material nature. Those who are situated in goodness generally worship the demigods. The demigods include Brahma, Shiva, and others such as Indra, Chandra, and the sun god. There are various demigods, 33 million of them. Those in goodness worship a particular demigod for a particular purpose. Similarly, those who are in the mode of passion worship the demons. We recall that during the Second World War, a man in Calcutta worshipped Hitler because, thanks to that war, he had amassed a large amount of wealth by dealing in the black market. So that was similar to the example I gave before of a man who was worshipping another politician, although Hitler was the biggest demon. Horrible, horrible, horrible. I cannot say horrible enough times. But people worship horrible people. Similarly, those in the modes of passion and ignorance generally select a powerful man to be God. They think that anyone can be worshipped as God, and the same results will be obtained. Now it is clearly described here that those who are in the mode of passion worship and create such gods, and those who are in the mode of ignorance in darkness worship dead spirits. Sometimes people worship at the tomb of some dead man. Sexual service is also considered to be in the mode of darkness, you know, prostitution. Similarly, in remote villages, and also this type of kundalini yoga, which they engage some sort of sex life. Similarly, in remote villages in India, there are worshippers of ghosts. We have seen that in India, the lower class people sometimes go to the forest and if they have knowledge that the ghost lives in a tree, they worship that tree and offer sacrifices. And of course, there's that story of Bhaktivinoda Thakur, who freed the ghost from the tree. And Ramanujacharya did something very, very similarly uh, to, to that, you know, freeing a ghost from not just the tree, but from a princess. There's a whole story about that. These different kinds of worship are not actually God worship. God worship is for persons who are transcendentally situated in pure goodness. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, the four, fourth canto, third chapter, text 23, it is said, Satvam Vishuddham Vasudeva Shabditam. When a man is situated in pure goodness, he worships Vasudeva. The purport is that those who are completely purified of the material modes of nature who are transcendentally situated, can worship the Supreme Personality of God in. The impersonalists, that means people think that God ultimately has no personality, he's ultimately formless, uh, are supposed to be situated in the mode of goodness, and they worship five kinds of demigods. They worship the impersonal Vishnu form in the material world, which is known as the philosophized Vishnu. Vishnu is the expansion of the Supreme Personality of God in, but the impersonalists because they do not ultimately believe in the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Imagine that the Vishnu form is just another aspect of the impersonal Brahman. Similarly, they imagine that Lord Brahma is the impersonal form in the material mode of passion. Thus, they sometimes describe five kinds of gods that are worshipable, uh, but because they think the actual truth is impersonal Brahman, they dispose of all worshipable objects at the ultimate end. In conclusion, the different qualities of the material modes of nature can be purified through association with persons who are aware or are of transcendental nature. So that this is an important point about the impersonalists. They may worship God, or they may even worship great saints, but they just use them and God as a stepping stone or stepping stones to achieve their ultimate goal. Prabhupada was oftentimes say the impersonalists uh, they step over the spiritual master, excuse me, and then they kick him away. Let's kick him away. I don't need you anymore. I don't need Krishna anymore. You know, I realized what I wanted to realize. And so, you know, who the, sorry, who the heck needs you? You were just helping me at a certain point. Just like when I went to school, I went to first grade, second grade, third grade, you know, et cetera. 
And I graduate. I didn't need my teacher anymore. I'm not worshiping my teacher, respecting my teacher. Not, hey, may have fond memories. But, you know, hey, I'm not going back to my teachers. Of course, they're all dead by now. That's another subject matter. <laughs> so, anyway, so now we'll go on to the next text, text 5 to 6. Ashashravidango ram tapyate etapo janaha damba hankara sanyukta kamaraga balanvitaha akarsyanta shirirastam bhutra gramam acheta saha Vam chai vanta shri rastam tan vidyasura nishchayan. A shastra, not in the scriptures. Vihitam directed, goram harmful to others. Tapyante undergo. Yea, those who tapaha, austerities, janaha, persons, dumba with pride, ahankara, and egoism. Sangyukta, engaged, kama, of lust, raga, an attachment, bala, by the force, anvita, impelled. Karsiyantaha, tormenting, shirirastam, situated within the body, Buddha gramam, the combination of material elements, acheta saha, having a misled mentality, mam, me, cha, also, eva, certainly, anta, within, shirirastam, situated in the body, tam, them, vidi, understand, asura, nishchayan, demons. <laughs> Those who undergo severe austerities and penances, not recommended in the scriptures, performing them out of pride and egotism, or impelled by lust and attachment, who are foolish and who torture the material elements of the body as well as the super soul dwelling within, are to be known as demons. Ooh, there are persons who manufacture modes of austerity and penance, which are not mentioned in the scriptural injunctions, for instance, fasting for some ulterior purpose, such as to promote a purely political end, is not mentioned in the scriptural directions. The scriptures recommend fasting for spiritual advancement, not for some political end or social purpose. Persons who take to such austerities are, according to Bhagavad Gita, certainly demoniac. Their acts are against the scriptural injunctions and are not beneficial for the people in general. Actually, they act out of pride, false ego, lust, and attachment for material enjoyment. But such by such activities, not only is the combination of material elements of which the body is constructed disturbed, but also the supreme personality of God himself living within the body. Some, such unauthorized fasting or austerities for some political end are certainly very disturbing to others. But obvious who Prabhupada is referring to here, and I'm not going to mention his name because it may offend some people. They are not mentioned in the Vedic literature. A demoniac person may think that he can force his enemy or other parties to comply with his desire by this method, but sometimes one dies by such fasting. These acts are not approved by the Supreme Personality of God, and he says that those who engage in them are demons. Such demonstrations are insults to the Supreme Personality of Godhead because they are enacted in disobedience to the Vedic scriptural injunctions. The word the saha is significant in this connection. Persons of normal mental condition must obey the scriptural injunctions. Those who are not in such a position neglect and disobey the scriptures and manufacture their own way of austerities and penances. One should always remember the ultimate end of the demoniac people as described in the previous chapter, the Lord forces them to take birth into the wombs of demoniac persons. <laughs> Consequently, they will live by demoniac principles life after life without knowing their relationship with the Supreme Personality of God. If, however, such persons are fortunate enough to be guided by a spiritual master who can direct them to the path of Vedic wisdom, they can get out of this entanglement and ultimately achieve the supreme goal. This is very important. So if one can actually, even someone who is demoniac comes in contact with a pure devotee, then his whole consciousness can be changed, like the story of Valmiki, who was a dacoit before, or like the story of Magrari, who was a hunter who half killed animals before. I mean, there's so many, or Jagai and Madai, I mean, it's one story, or what to speak of Prabhupada's followers, you know, who were hippies before, not me. And by the association with the pure devotee, everything changed, hippies to happies. Prabhupada said that was his greatest miracle to transform hippies to happies. So, what I am going to do right now is end the reading and take questions because I, re I have to be finished exactly at 6 
to be able to participate uh, in a uh, Vyasa Puja ceremony for His Holiness Bhakti Chu Maharaj. So I just am ending a few minutes earlier with the reading so we can have time for questions. And tomorrow we'll continue with text 7. We did up to text 6 today. So now we can ask or answer questions. Give me one second to unmute you. There we go. Yes. Okay, who has a question? Hopefully I'll be able to hear you. Don't all Hi. speak at once. Oh, Nikunja. Uh, okay. You started off uh, uh, talking about pleasing Krishna. So can you uh, elaborate a little more on how you know whether the modes, um, when you're following the scriptures, um, are you pleasing Krishna or how, how do you know that? Or is this something you should only think that that's your aim and whether Krishna is pleased, that would be revealed in some time? How does it work? Well, actually, there's a statement in the Bhagavatam. Vasudeva Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Priyojita Janayati Asu Vairagyam Gyanam Cha Yada Hoitakam. One becomes, one understands that Krishna is pleased when one gets things revealed to him. Yeah, we all have these revelations. Wow, I finally understand I'm not the body. Wow, I understand I'm a servant of Krishna. Wow. Uh, now I finally understand what Krishna's rasa dance is all about. I mean, there's all these different realizations according to our level of devotional service. So uh, it's stated in that verse that I just quoted that one gets causeless knowledge and causeless renunciation. Two things. The realizations, and the second one is you become detached from things that you were attached to before. And I've often described that to be like a snake. Sorry, we're not snakes. But like a snake shedding his skin as he grows. And I used to live in a place where there were snakes all over the place. And they kept shedding their skin. And I found them skins in my closet, which is interesting, hanging from the big hangers. Anyway. I wasn't frightened, it was just like, they were devotees, they were my the first disciples. Anyway, so, so anyway, so, I won't comment on the existing disciples. So, uh, so anyway, so you experienced like the things you were interested in before, hey, why am I no longer interested in that? Why am I no longer interested in having a fast car? Why am I no longer interested in uh, bungee jumping. Because <laughs> I never was interested in bungee jumping, I have to be honest. I thought it was pretty stupid. So uh, why am I no longer interested in those things? So it's like all these attachments, they fade away. Like going to Disneyland or Disney World or, you know, whatever. Or seeing the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Actually, I've been to Paris. I've seen the Eiffel Tower. It's just a stupid piece of metal. Anyway, so, uh, so that's how one tells one's advancing by, or when Krishna's pleased, you really get realization. And also, the deities smile at you, and also the spiritual master, he'll say, yeah, you did a good job. Uh, but you can see, like, you go before the deities in the morning, hopefully you go before the deities in the morning, or at least see them online or something like that, and you see, what are, what are they saying to you? They're smiling. I mean, I've seen Krishna smile a lot because we have a dancer there in the temple. Before that, I don't know Krishna smiled at me that much. But because we have uh, Champaka dancing, then Krishna really smiles a lot. I don't know if she's still online. Yes, she's online. So she heard that. Then, then Krishna smiles. So, so that's how I can tell you know, whether Krishna is pleased and making advancement, and I lose attraction for things in this world. And I really have an attraction for hearing and chanting. You know, Vasudeva Kata Ruchi, Shan Mahat Seviya Vipra, Punya Tirtha Nishevana. That's another verse from the Bhagavatam. That one gets uh, a real ruchi or a taste, a 
people hearing. You know, you hear about Krishna, well, let me hear more. Uh, hearing Krishna's philosophy, hearing about Krishna's pure devotees, hearing about Krishna's pastimes uh, in any of his various incarnations, and especially in uh, Goloka, in Nava. And then one actually becomes very enlivened. So, anyway, this is how you tell. You know, it's not that difficult. Like Prabhupada was asked one time by a Pajari, is Krishna pleased with me? Not me, but, you know, whatever. And Prabhupada answered, you're the Pajari, you should know. You know, the, in other words, if you're worshipping deities, or chanting the holy names, you know whether Krishna is pleased with you. It's not, it's not a hard thing. And it doesn't mean when Krishna is pleased with you, you get all your wishes, you, open, you wake up the next morning with a million dollars under the Christmas tree or something like that. That, that. that may be an indication that Maya is pleased with you. <laughs> you know, like the story of Vishwamitra Muni. He woke up one morning and found Menaka under the Christmas tree. Not Christmas, obviously. So does that mean that Krishna was pleased with him? No, it meant that he was being tested by Maya, specifically the demigods who were agents of Maya in that particular case. So Krishna being pleased doesn't mean everything goes all right. I mean, that sometimes we have that feeling that everything's going all right. Like this song from the 1960s, what is it? Zippity doo da, zippity day. I don't know if anyone's heard that song before. Anyway, whatever it is. Don't look it up at Google. It's a nonsense song. So, uh, you know, that everything's going my way. You know, it's a bright day. The sun is shining. Everyone loves me. Krishna must be pleased. No. That doesn't mean that Krishna's pleased with you. Or I'm not healthy. So, Sometimes people are like, oh, I'm sick. Krishna must not like me. He must be displeased. It has nothing to do with it. It has nothing to do with it. Krishna could be really pleased with you and you could be sick as a dog. Or Krishna could be very displeased with you and you could be as strong as Atlas. I don't know if you, any of you know who Atlas is. He holds up the whole world. So, so you really can't judge Krishna's pleasure by, you know, the external amenities that you get. It has nothing to do with it. It is not related at all. Krishna's pleasure is manifest by Vasudeva Katha Ruchi Shan Mahatsevya Vipra Punya Shevana by attraction to hearing about Krishna, realization and renunciation. Vasudeva Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Pariyojita Janayati Aisu Ashu Vairagya. Vairagya means without passion. That's really good. You know, if you wake up one morning, you don't desire to enjoy this material world, <gasps> exploit nature, or manipulate things, then you got it made. Of course, if you wake up in the morning, you don't want to do these things, you may be dead, but anyway, that's another reason. But really, if you wake up and you're not dead, and you still have a lot of energy, and you have no desire to exploit, that means Christians please, and you're doing the right thing. Okay, good question. These are the standards for understanding. And you're happy. You know, happy, happy. Not just goofy happy. You know, some people are goofy happy. I'm happy because I just ate a lot of prasadam. <laughs> That's goofy. So I'm happy because Krishna's smiling at me. That's where a devotee's happiness is based upon Krishna's happiness. So, like, you know, like I, I mentioned the other day that, you know, someone asked me, if someone would ask me, what makes you happy? And I'd say, well, Prabhupada would be pleased. And so that's, you know, that's devotional attitude. Okay, who else has a question? Krishna, my obeisance. Oh, Karna, okay. Yes, uh, because you are speaking about this and uh, I'm asking, um, I've heard one Mataji said uh, very, um, I don't know, two months, three months ago, she said, uh, when I'm happy, Krishna is happy. And I just want to know, it. Oh, we usually said when Krishna is happy, we are happy. So it's a, a mode of ignorance or what? I don't know, I don't understand. I'm just an illusion, it's an illusion. It's an illusion. Yeah. And, what, and illusion. what do you think about 
Uh, okay, sorry. It may be in any of the modes of nature, but it's a just big illusion. You know, it's sort of ignorance. If I am happy, Krishna is happy. No, I may be unhappy and Krishna may be happy. And Krishna may be unhappy and I may be happy. You know, so it has, it actually has no relationship. But basically, a devotee is always happy, even when they're, even when they're miserable, they're happy. When they're feeling separation, just like you hear Lord Chaitanya prays. Yugaitam nimishena chakshu shaprabhashaitam shunyaitam jagatsaram govinda vidhenime. Uh, Krishna, feeling your separation, I'm considering a moan to be like 12 years and more, and tears are flowing from my eyes like torrents of rain. I'm feeling all vacant in the world in your absence. And so that, you know, devotee may be, but it's not really misery, because by this feeling of intense separation from Krishna, even feeling transcendental misery is ecstasy. In the material world, feeling misery is misery, and feeling ecstasy means the misery is coming very quickly. <laughs> Just now coming. You know, it's just like, wow, oh my God. I'm feeling happy, materially happy. Oh my God, I, I don't know what's going to happen in a half an hour from now. So that's, or how I'm going to feel in it. You know, so anyway. So, oh, I hate to use the sannyasa examples. You know, someone may meet the girl in their dreams and then she turns into be a nightmare. Yeah, <laughs> they're good dreams and bad dreams. And so anyway, so forget, forgive me for that one. It just like comes out automatically. So anyway, so so our happiness or unhappiness should be based upon how Krishna is happy. Krishna wants us to be happy, but sometimes we're materially happy, and Krishna is not pleased with us. Okay. I think we have time for another question before. Hare Krishna, Gude. Yeah, Harisha Kesh. Uh, yes, Gude. So can we say that just to serve Krishna itself is happiness? Just to serve Krishna's happiness? Yes. Yeah, but because we, we don't have to really look for happiness. Just serving himself is a, uh, itself is an happiness. The the devotee just, doesn't, an advanced devotee is not focused on achieving his or her happiness. Advanced devotee is is engaged in loving exchange trying to please Krishna, and that's their happiness. I mean, it sounds like a contradiction. But anyway, a devotee is not concentrated on their own happiness. A devotee wants to make Krishna and his devotees happy. That's the point. And so that, that should be our consciousness. And, you know, whether we're happy or not, if Krishna's smiling, then it really shouldn't, anyway, shouldn't make any difference. But then you're happy anyway, because of Krishna's smiling. It just depends on... What is your standard of happiness? You know, my standard is Krishna and Prabhupada smiling. Other people have another standard. You know, that, you know, their wife or husband smiling. So if their wife or husband are pure devotees, then actually that's pretty good. So we should serve a pure devotee so we can make them happy. And... On that note, I have to be at the Vyasa Puja in one minute from now. And Rishikesh, you have to be there too. Yes, we do. Yeah. And I'm going to speak for a few minutes there. So anyway, so we want to thank everybody. Sorry for the shortened class tonight, but we have so many responsibilities. I mean, all day long I'm on conferences, GVC conferences, deciding how to destroy the world and so many things like that. So... I mean, it's a computer, I just want to stream on the computer too many hours a day right now. I'd like to travel to go to New Zealand, Australia, Fiji. I can't answer any more questions in book, so that's it. So I'd like to travel, like to be with you all, but Krishna is not permitting me or the coronavirus. Maybe soon, pray. Okay, all glorious to his divine grace, Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, Kijai.